a week ago today in this cathedral, I ordained four men as deacons, each of whom look forward to returning here a year from now to be ordained priests. This afternoon, we reassembled in this holy place to celebrate the ordination of two deacons through the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Rick Barner and Christian Tavares Velasquez. What a gift and a blessing. Rick and Christian, the priests, deacons, religious, and laity of the Diocese of Sagan, rejoice with you, your parents, family members, and friends as you begin your priestly life. The rite of ordination is a magnificent ceremony filled with age-old ritual and symbolism. If you follow it carefully, you can see the mystery and the meaning of priesthood unfold before your eyes. For me, one of the most moving elements of every ordination is the moment when the ordinateurs prostrate themselves before the altar. As the chanting of the names of Mary, the apostles, and the saints wash over them. What an awesome realization of being called to join this long line of holy men and women in service to God and His people. At my own diagonal, I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as I lay on that floor. I was excited to begin my service as a deacon. A year later, at my ordination to priesthood, my thoughts, like many young vocations at that time, focused on my childhood dream of celebrating Mass and consecrating bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. At both ordinations, I felt absolutely ready Despite the fact that I was recognized in years, young and a bit naive, as well as lacking experience in life's challenges and the awareness of the full meaning of priesthood. At my Episcopal coordination, my thoughts and emotions were significantly different. After 29 years of experience in the responsibilities of priestly life, I felt totally unworthy and inadequate. One thing I learned in my priesthood, however, was how essential it is to remain in the Lord and rely on His grace for everything. Rick and Christian, I have been to instruct you on everything there is to know about priesthood. I know it's an impossible test, but I so wanted to help you see and feel and know all that your priesthood holds in store for you, lessons and the sacraments. Instead, I have been content to let your own priesthood unfold as it must for every priest. And so I chose to reflect on our gospel account from St. John. I believe it captures the essence of priestly ministry. Let this word of the Lord prepare your hearts and minds to commit to his will in the sanctification of his people. St. John's Gospel appears to men with chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. They are actually entitled, The Conclusion. But then, John adds chapter 21, a portion of which was just proclaimed. This chapter begins with the post-resurrection scene, where the apostles had been fishing all night but caught nothing. Jesus appears, and by his very presence, they are able to catch more fish than their nets could handle. John recalls that the disciples did not presume to ask, Who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. After Jesus leaves the apostles, he 
turns to Peter and begins that wonderful dialogue. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? This final chapter of John's Gospel is more than an appendix. Like many works of literature, it serves as a summary of the book itself. And more to the point, it captures the essence of John's understanding of discipleship. In St. Mark's account of the call of the disciples, the evangelist says that Jesus summoned the men that he himself had decided on and called them for three purposes to be with him, to be sent out, and to expel demons. On the other hand, in the first chapter of John's Gospel, the apostles are called to come and see and follow him. In the next 11 chapters, the apostles do come and see all the signs and wonders Jesus performed, as recalled by John. At this stage of their formation, they only needed to be with Jesus. During this time, the apostles appear somewhat faithful to Jesus, but even if they do question his teachings and threaten to abandon him because of the absurdity of his message. But as Peter realized, Jesus alone had the words of eternal life. And then the account of these signs and wonders is followed by chapter 12 and the events of Holy Week. Here we see the disciples in total disarray. Jesus speaks more intensely about his own suffering and the need for them to suffer as well. They must be servants of all, even having to wash each other's feet. Most importantly, he reminds them that they can do nothing without him. I am the vine, you are the branches. Then comes the arrest, the persecution, the false testimony, the ridicule, the passion and death of Jesus. In the midst of this confusion, Peter refuses to acknowledge that he was ever with Jesus, or that he even knows him. When the people in the courtyard recognize Peter as having been with Jesus, are you not one of his followers? Did I not see you with him in the garden? Peter denies it. So much for being with Jesus. Following the resurrection, the apostles are even more confused. Is Jesus alive? Is it only a ghost? Even though it appears that the apostles are beginning to believe, they remain powerless and afraid. Nonetheless, with each new appearance of Jesus, as they return to being with him, their faith and confidence begins to mount. And now the formation comes full circle. Here they are again with Jesus, witnessing the power that comes with being in his presence, the power in which they too would share. Jesus seizes the moment to question Peter about his love, not to embarrass him, but to allow Peter the opportunity to step forward and profess his readiness to be a servant and witness. This ministry would require an exceptional moment. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than me? Christ's response to each of Peter's profession of love is to anoint him as shepherd, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, 